uh, we're going to do a volume three. We had a very popular set called On Angels, volume one and two. And we touched on some topics in those that have gotten a lot of questions. So we're, going, we're adding volume three in two sessions to our collection on angels. And this particular one has the subtitle, if you want one, The Denizens of the Metacosm. And we'll explain those terms as we go here. But I want to start by pointing out something that is more perhaps broadly useful than just the topic at hand. I want to talk a little bit about a science that is in total frustration. There's an area called astrobiology, life in outer space kind of thing. And um, there continues to be nothing but bad news for the astrobiologists. Now, what's important here is that you, you need to understand science is the study of evidence. That's the root definition. Astrobiology hasn't found any evidence to study. That's the practical truth. Look though they try. And despite extensive searching, there isn't any evidence of life outside the planet Earth. That's the facts. That's the reality. And uh, don't confuse wishful thinking with evidence. Because all kinds of people writing all kinds of books who have all kinds of hunches or conjectures, fine. But uh, so this science has yet to demonstrate that its subject even exists. So let's get that in perspective here. And uh, this isn't science, it's priesthood. It has belief structures, it has high priests, it has creeds. That's, that's not science, that's priesthood. And uh, so the, uh, don't be surprised if astrobiology develops the same ethics as has pervaded the study of paleontology and climatology, which are notorious for scandals, deliberate frauds, astonishing things. And so uh, here's the key fact to think about and put in your notes. To even pursue its search is a denial of the conspicuous mathematical requirements for life to exist. Anyone that's chasing that is demonstrating an ignorance of what's known broadly in science as the anthropic principle. What do I mean by that? And uh, the anthropic principle, as they call it, has cataloged over 140 quantifiable characteristics, each of which must fall within extremely narrow ranges for physical life to exist. There's a long list of these, and I, I'll spare you the long list. It's in some of our other materials if you want. And uh, there are now over 400 quantifiable characteristics for advanced life to exist. Now, here's the key point. When you recognize that many of these factors individually require a precision of less than one part per million, their composite effect constitutes what you could consider a very good definition of a miracle. When you have hundreds of things, each of which have to be, you know, within 10 to the 6th or better, or worse, I should say, uh, then you know that the composite effect pushes that out beyond Borel's law. It becomes absurd to consider it, by definition in mathematics, by the way. There's something even more profound than the anthropic principle, and that's the teleological principle. And we're indebted to two guys who demonstrated that the universe is designed not only for life to exist, but for it to be discovered. There's a book and a set of films called The Privileged Planet, How Our Place in the Cosmos is Designed for Discovery. And, this, and both the book and films are Guillermo Gonzalez and Jay Richards. They're associated with the Discovery Institute, and which is identified with uh, the uh, intelligent design movement. Gonzalez works as a senior fellow of the Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture. Terrific book. Chase it down. It'll surprise you. So I want to, if you're starting to talk about astrobiology theologically, I want to consider it in the light of the covenant with Israel. I want to consider it with regards to the incarnation itself, with the crucifixion, and with the second coming of Christ. It's astonishing that each of these demonstrations in history put the death knell 
to astrobiology, strangely enough. And uh, so let's talk about the covenant with Israel. And uh, so I want you to notice the universal language which God's specific covenant with Israel is recorded. Notice what God is saying in Deuteronomy 4. For ask now of the days that are past, which were before thee, since the day that God created man upon the earth, and ask from the one side of heaven to the other, whether there hath been any such thing as this great thing is, or hath been heard like it. That's God extolling the covenant with Israel. That is a huge statement. It's, it's universal. So the covenant with Israel is unique to the earth. The covenant with Israel is exclusive to humans. And the covenant with Israel is universally unprecedented. There hasn't been anything like it earlier, and there will never be anything like that after that. That means, in effect, that the incarnation of Jesus Christ as our Savior, delivered via Israel, is also universal. Let's not lose sight of that. It's not our private little truth. It's universal throughout the universe. Then let's focus on the incarnation here. It's interesting when you think about it. The most compelling argument for the uniqueness of terrestrial life on planet Earth is the incarnation of the Creator Himself. Your verses are in your notes. You can look it up at your leisure. Who became an everlasting member of the human race. Think about that. Put that in perspective. Understand how that's impacted by these people that believe there's additional life that isn't covered by any of these things. Remember, I, I love this, I, Isaiah 9, 6. Every Christmas we always have these on our Christmas cards. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. A child is born... And a son is given. How many people read that and think that's a synonym or a Hebraic parallelism? No, 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 no. Be careful. The child is born as his humanity. And that was fulfilled in a place called Bethlehem. The son is given is something quite else. That's his divinity. And that was demonstrated at Golgotha. Very distinct. And this is one of the reasons when you start studying your Bible, I, I am suspicious of any synonym. Two words may be synonymous. They mean almost the same thing. But be careful with that word almost because hidden in the difference can be an enormous discovery. The crucifixion. The crucifixion of Christ involved more than just our personal redemption. That may surprise you. It involved the entire creation. That's one reason we took our study of Isaiah 53 and published it as a special study in its own right in two sessions calling it the fulcrum of the universe. That shouldn't surprise us. Psalm 19 gives us a clue. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows His handiwork. And it goes far beyond our usual understanding. And of course, it's a result of the, of the declaration by, of God of war against the serpent in Genesis 3. In Romans 8, we have the clarification. The creation was subject to entropy, not by consent, but on account of the one who subjected it so as to involve hope. Continuing, because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. We call that entropy mathematically. Into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until what? Until now. The redemption of Jesus Christ. That impacts more than you and I. That, that impacts the basic creation from one end to the other. Now, there's another rebuttal that you should be aware of. That's the eschatological one. The second coming of Christ itself is a rebuttal to any eschatological role for any life beyond the planet Earth. Wow. Hang, it on, hang your hat on that one. There's even a real sense that Isaiah 53 is predictive events which have not happened yet in the sense that it describes what happens when Israel ultimately recognizes officially her Messiah. That's what it's really all about. That's why we call it the pivot of all history. One of the other things that we explained in our 
the earlier volumes on angels that I just want to review quickly because you'll need the perspective from where we're heading here. We did a little study called The Boundaries of Reality. Our physical reality, we discover, has boundaries. And we use the vitruper of man of Da Vinci as just our symbolic representation of the reach of man. Going large to the large side, to the right side, we have that which is larger than man. We call that the macrocosm. That plunges in, uh, us into astronomy, astrophysics, that sort of thing. And we know that we live in time, four dimensions, not three. But most significantly, one of the most important discoveries of 20th century science was that the universe is not finite. It had a beginning. It is finite. It may be expanding, but it is finite. It is not infinite. Profound discovery. Going the other way, looking at things that are smaller than man, we call that the microcosm. That plunges us into particle physics and so forth. We discover in that strange world, everything we find, length, mass, energy, time, are made up of indivisible units, units that cannot be divided. It's digital. And we call it Planck's limits. Whether it's length, mass, energy, or time, it has a definitive limit. If you try to get smaller than that limit, the particle loses locality, strangely enough. Very strange stuff. And we know that we live not in, not in the four dimensions that Einstein discovered. We now realize, for a lot of reasons, we live in ten dimensions. We covered all that in the earlier summary. But the point that I want to bring forth here is that we now know that our physical reality is limited on the big side and it's limited in smallness, which is a strange discovery. That means that you and I live in a virtual reality, a digital environment. It can't get larger than that and it can't get smaller than that. That larger reality, for lack of another name, we'll just call the metacosm. It's, it, it, it contains within it a subset of what we know as physical reality. And that's not some conclusion of a theologian. That's a, a conclusion that you can find in Scientific American in the June 2005 issue where they have an article on the subject. And their conclusion is that our universe is but a shadow of a larger reality, to which we say, no kidding, Dick Tracy, that's what the Bible has been saying all along. And so, this is, not, this is all by way of review from our earlier things, but it leads to where we're headed because this metacosm contains creatures of various kinds. And uh, we're going to talk about the advent of the hybrids in this session. And we're, we've just reviewed the, the role of the metacosm as a warm-up here. But that leads us, whether we like it or not, leads us into the subject of UFOs. These paradoxical dilemmas that continue to plague our horizon. We'll talk about the mysteries of what happened at Roswell, New Mexico. We'll talk about Majestic 12 and the role of disinformation in this strange world. And we'll talk about the dark side of the UFOs, the abductions. And we'll talk about the geopolitical agenda that's emerging from this that will surprise you when we get there. But let's start by admonishing ourselves to be cautious and keep an open mind. Proverbs tells us, He that answereth the matter before he heareth it it is a folly and a shame unto him. So whatever you happen to, whatever you bring to this exploration about UFOs, set it aside for the moment and try to approach it with an open mind. Because people err both ways. Many believe they don't, they're, they're not real and others get overly carried away. Let's try to have a balance here and let's try to understand what's really going on. Are they real is the first question that we're confronted with. The problem is there is much, of course, that's uncorroborated, disinformation, unreliable. There, there's probably no subject I know of that's more difficult to research than this one because of all the nonsense, all the noise, all the deliberate hoaxes, and so forth. The problem, though, is when you cut through all of that, there's too much to ignore that is substantiated, involving multiple reliable witnesses. You can't escape that. They have been plotted on multiple radars simultaneously, worldwide. And yet, despite all that, they seem to violate physical laws. Therein is the dilemma. Because what they're doing can't be done. And yet it is. When we study this historically, we discover they're actually recorded all through history. We find Stone Age murals, Egyptian hieroglyphics that allude to them, the journals of Alexander the Great detail them. Christopher Columbus's ship's log even mentions them. Buffalo Bill's autobiography. To Americans, that's a big deal. He has some surprising uh, aspects to that. 
And I threw one more in here. A new friend of ours is L.A. Marzulis. He's discovered Nephilim skulls in Peru. You can't escape these things. They're not human, and yet they seem almost human. What are they? What's going on here? So we have, we're moving into an area that some people call the age of the hybrids. And that'll involve us to understand Genesis chapter 6. And it's astonishing to discover how many seminaries and how many sources fail to deal with that in a scriptural way. Numbers 13, Revelation 9 deals with these issues. Let's take a look here. In Genesis chapter 6, the first two verses read as follows. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now one of the first errors that occurs is people don't notice those two verses are one sentence. That's all in one sentence. And uh, the, we have this term, Benaiah Elohim. That's a Hebrew term for a direct creation of God. It's used of angels. Adam was a direct creation of God. His offspring were not. They were offspring of Adam. But angels were direct creations. They're called, that's why they use that term. And that term is used consistently in the Old Testament that way. The daughters of men actually is Benoth Adam. They're daughters of Adam. Not Seth, as some seminaries try to twist. No, let's understand what the text really says. And what it says is uncomfortable, but it says it. That these angels, apparently fallen angels, chose to somehow pursue the creation of hybrids with human women. The sons of God. Now that, that term is angels and is so tre uh, treated. Uh, Job 1, 6, 2, 1, 3, 8, 7 is a lot. Even in Luke 20, 36, you have the same thought expressed that way. It's also in the book of Enoch. Now don't misunderstand my alluding to the book of Enoch. It's not an inspired piece of writing. It's a useful document brought, uh, collected about the, two, the second century before Christ. What makes it so useful, it expresses the belief of the rabbis in that period. It's useful for grammar and for vocabulary. So it's a very useful document for study without attributing it, attributing it to being... I'm not, I don't want to get into the whole issue of uh, anything more than that, but it is very useful. And so, uh, and we could go through the exegesis of Jubilees, Josephus, Dead Sea Scrolls, and on and on. And of course, the Septuagint, the most knowledgeable experts three centuries before Christ, translated their scriptures into Greek, and they made it very, very clear. They, that, that's very interesting. They used a term. I'll come to that in a minute. In verse 4 of chapter 6 of Genesis, it says, There were Nephilim in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them. The same became the mighty men which are of old, men of renown. The word Nephilim comes from a Hebrew uh, verb meaning uh, nephal, which means the fallen ones. That's in the Hebrew. It suggests they are the fallen ones. They are the hybrid offspring of this uh, uh, unnatural union. And uh, so notice that verse 4 also hints that it's not limited to the Genesis 6 event. It's also after that. And in Genesis 15 and following, we discover that there were four centuries where Satan could lay down a minefield, the tribes in the Canaan that Joshua was then ordered to totally wipe out. There's a whole another piece of background that comes out of that. The Nephilim, the fallen ones in the Hebrew, Nephal, to fall, to cast away, and so forth. It, the, the mighty ones, the Hagibarim, are the result of those. Now the Septuagint in the Greek, they use the word gigantes, that's transliterated giants. They happen to be giants, but that's not what the word means. It, uh, the, the word uh, comes from gigas, which means earthborn. So the Hebrew says they're fallen ones, they're, and, they, and the Greek says they are earthborn. Both of them are alluding to the hybrid nature of the offspring. The fact that they were giants, at least in the old days, is true, but misleading. The, the mis people misunderstand what the Greek is really saying there. The English words, um, the genea means breed or kind. The English words genes and genetics comes from the same Greek, uh, uh, Greek root. When you get to verse 9 of Genesis chapter 6, you get another clue as to what's really going on. Why did God decide to wipe out the entire world except for eight people? Well, in verse 9, it says that these are the generations, or the family tree, if you will, of Noah. 
Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Now that word perfect in the Hebrew is the word tamim, which means without blemish, sound, without spot, unimpaired. It speaks of a physical defect. What that word, what that is actually saying is that his genealogy was unblemished, implying that the others were blemished by these the shenanigans of the fallen angels. Now people have a real hang up on this can angels can angels have sex? And they love to quote Matthew 22:30 or Mark 12:25 in that regard where Jesus himself says, "For in the resurrection they meaning the, the, they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are as the angels of God in heaven." He's making a statement about the angels in heaven, the ones that are behaving themselves. His, his statement doesn't embrace those that are on deliberate misbehavior. So don't get that confused. And there's more that we get in there, but don't let it get hung up on that. There is a word that shows up in the text, Oketerian, that seems to refer to the body as a dwelling place for the spirit. The body as a, as a, as a residence, if you will, for the spirit. It shows up twice in the Bible. It shows up in Jude 6, and it's the domain from which the angels disrobed. The angels that were bent on mischief disrobed from their Oketerian in order to indulge in whatever they were doing. The other place that word shows up is in the positive sense in 2 Corinthians 5.2, where it alludes to the heavenly body with which the believer longs to be clothed. So as we encounter these texts, we should begin to sense the fact that that is used as a highly technical term for what it's worth. And so, um, the habitation. Jude and Judah says, The angels which kept not the first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. That word habitation is Ocaterian. But it continues, as even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So Jude is making a comparison of Sodom and Gomorrah with the chicanery of these fallen angels that he makes reference to, the Ocaterian. When you get to Paul's second letter to Corinthians, 5 verse 1 and 2, he says, We know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house that is from heaven. Again, he's there, that passage is using this particular word, Oketerian, or habitat, if you will. This understanding of the Nephilim is important to understand the rest of the Old Testament too, by the way, because there are also Nephilim after the flood, after all of that. In Genesis 6-4, he warns us about that. There are four tribes, the Rephaim, the Emim, the Horim, and Zamzumim, in Genesis 14 and 15. It also makes reference to Arba, Anak, and his seven sons, which are known as the Anakim. They're encountered in Canaan, Numbers 13, 33. There were Nephilim in the land when the spies went in there. Og, the king of Bashan, is detailed in Deuteronomy 3 and Joshua 12. A giant, a Nephilim, if you will. And of course, we all know the story of Goliath. But many people don't realize why David picked up five stones when he crossed the brook. Because Goliath had four brothers. That gives you a whole different perspective of our friend David. And even Jesus makes an allusion here that's very strange in, in uh, Psalm 22. Verse 12, as he hangs on the cross, he makes reference to the bulls of Bashan which surround him. Is he talking about cattle from, from the Galan Heights? No, no. That's apparently a metaphor for the demons that are, are, were involved. Well, so much for a quick snapshot of the past. I hope that's a review for you. But what about today? The days of Noah is what Jesus warned us of. Remember, he said that, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And that phrase is uh, a provocative one, especially as you study the whole passage there. Because at first it just seems as if it was in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the, the, the coming of the Son of Man be. So he's, he's talking about the surprise value of it. There may be more here, though, than just that. He goes on. Then shall be two in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not in what hour the Lord doth come. 
See, I'm convinced that the whole scheme is to catch Satan by surprise. And I get that from the following verse, among other places. Jesus says, But know this, if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Don't be thrown by the King James translation, good man. Okay? Jesus saying, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. The good man of the house, Oka is, is means the head of the house. That's not necessarily the good guy. Who is the, who is the prince of this world? Satan. He's the head of the house. If the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and he would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Interesting. What is that talking about here? I believe it's the good man of the house, to use that phrase here, that's going to get caught by surprise. He would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Well, let's shift gears to another. So this is, I could bore you all evening with sightings, interesting ones, of UFOs. But this one I'll mention because I was there. It was July 19th through the 26th, virtually a week there, in 1952 in Washington, D.C. The reason I was there, because I happened to be uh, entering the Naval Academy. And I remember vividly, I have some pictures here, jets were alerted for these saucers. What's going on here? The paper was full of fiery objects outrun jets over the Capitol. This isn't a one-event thing. This continued all week long. Edwards Air Force Base, Washington National Airport, as it was known in those days, was shut down because of all this stuff going on. Experts push studies as objects in the skies are reported again. The Air Force experts continue their investigation. They have no idea what's going on. They scramble the fighters, and when they scramble them, these things disappear. The minute they land, they're all back again, harassing the air control and all the rest of it. Okay? A national incident. I remember it well. On July 19, 1952, at 11.40 p.m., seven UFOs were picked up on both the long-range radar at the air tra route traffic control, used for all the air traffic around Washington, D.C., as well as a short-range radar at Washington National Airport. Both these different radars are picking these things up. The encounter was fully documented by Edward J. Ruppelt, the director of Project Blue Book. The UFOs were only a few miles southeast of Andrews Air Force Base, and were initially traveling at a speed of somewhere between 100 to 130 miles per hour. The UFOs were examined on the radar scope by four controllers, con uh, uh, con including the senior air traffic controller on duty that night. Shortly after detection, two of the objects streaked away at approximately 7,000 miles per hour. This isn't a guess by a layman. This is their controller's reports. The senior controller immediately called the main control tower at the Washington National Airport, as well as the controllers at Air Andrews Air Force Base. The air traffic controllers at both sites confirmed not only the existence of the UFOs, but their rapid disappearance as well. What's going on? Nobody, nobody knew. Caused some panic within the uh, senior councils. And... Uh, for over a week, sightings and attempts by F-94 interceptors were involved throughout the area, harassing both civilian and military air traffic. Both multiple radars and visual sightings were involved. And I say I was there. I, uh, and the details of this, by the way, was, are detailed, if you're interested in it, in our book back then, in 1997, on alien encounters. And that, <laughs> this crazy book, I'll come back to that. It's a very strange story about the hunt behind that book. But let's move on here. Among the thousands of cases of UFOs reported in the last 50 years, more than 700 of these cases have been reported by experienced airline and military pilots. We're not talking about people looking in their backyard or whatever. We're talking about professionals. Now, the, the queen of all of these nightmares turns out to have occurred in 1947 at a place called Roswell, New Mexico. And to this day, it's still the most talked about thing. It's a continuing mystery. After Sheriff George Wilcox contacted military authorities at the Army, Roswell Army Airfield regarding a wreckage that was discovered on Mac Brazel's ranch, the area was sealed off. And on July 8th of 1947, Colonel William Blanchard, commander of the 509th Bomb Group, they're very distinguished because that was our atomic bomb group at the time, and they were in scouts there at Roswell. They were an elite group, if you will, in that sense. So Blanchard, uh, 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 resident of the base, issued an official press release stating that the wreckage of a crashed disc 
had been recovered. The press release was transmitted over the wire services in time to make the headlines in over 30 U.S. afternoon newspapers that same day. Whoops. Air Force panics. Because he, he did what we would have done. He put the word out. Not all the details, obviously. No details of the flying disks are revealed and so forth. However, with just within a few hours, a second press release was issued from the office Brigadier General Roger Ramey, who was commander of the 8th Air Force at Fort Worth Army Airfield in Texas, 400 miles away. That's the people to whom the 509th reported. So his boss, in effect, almost immediately issues a press release denying all that happened. The second press release rescinded the first one and in effect claimed that Colonel Blanchard and the officer of the 509th Bomb Group at Roswell had made an unbelievable foolish mistake and somehow incorrectly identified a weather balloon and its radar reflector as the wreckage of a crashed disk. This starts a series of cover stories that are so flimsy they are a tragic indictment on the capabilities of the press people uh, at that time. They threw together these these uh, uh, cover stories that just didn't hold any water. But the way the Roswell Daily is, uh, General Ramey empties the Roswell soccer. He, 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 uh, saucer, he, he, uh, he says the, the excitement is not justified. They're trying to bury this thing. Okay. Now there's a problem because we, they, in that press release, photographs were taken on July 8th of 1947 in Fort Worth, Texas by James Bond Johnson of the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, and they showed General Ramey, during the second press briefing, clutching a communique to Washington, D.C., while he was displaying a deflated weather balloon just hours after other Army officers in Roswell had reported the UFO crash. Got the picture. Roswell issued their thing. We're now in Texas, and they give a press release. But it happens, strangely, that while he had his press release, he was clutching a, some papers in his hand. And they didn't make anything of that at the time. But it turns out some interesting things happened subsequently. Many years later, using a digital photo scanner to enlarge and enhance the words printed on a folded piece of paper that Remy held, and using a computer program for digital enhancement that, and analysis, it has now been reported that researcher David Rudiak was able to identify two key phrases, quote, the, vic the victims of the wreck and in the disk they will ship. So, there's, see, the stories that came out of Roswell were that there had been four bodies in this disk that crashed and one was still alive. That's just a story. That's the rumor, okay? And there are previous witnesses that claimed to have seen the bodies of the aliens loaded on the B-29 and so forth. Everything was wrapped up and sent to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And so this, is the first, this was the first tangible evidence of what some people are calling the smoking gun that proves that there was a cover-up. They're not being direct. That, that implies that there apparently were victims in the wreck of some kind, and in the disk they will ship, and so forth. Let's just stop with, uh, let, let's just, if you stop and think, who would be the most competent witnesses about UFOs that you would imagine? I'm going to suggest our astronauts. Edward Mitchell, Apollo 14, April 1996, Dateline NBC. He said to public, he said, NASA is covering up what really happened at Roswell, New Mexico, period. Whoa! Astronaut Gordon Cooper, May 15th, 63, 22-orbit Mercury capsule. He saw a green UFO that was also attracted, that was also tracked by Australian radar, by the way. It wasn't some hallucination he had. He's testified before the United Nations that UFOs are visiting this planet. That's Gordon Cooper. In May 1996, he again was on record. He says, we are being visited by aliens, according to this astronaut. James Lovell and Frank, and, and Frank Borman, Gemini 7, December 65, 20, a second orbit of the 14-day flight, they saw a UFO. Gemini Control presumed it was the final stage of their own Titan booster. They indicated that they had both the booster and the UFO in sight. That's on the soundtracks. Walter Schirra, these names should be familiar to you. Mercury 8, 1968, first uses the code name Santa Claus, 
to indicate that UFOs are near the space camp. So they adopted that as a code on the because uh, the, the the broadcasts were public publicly open. See, and that code word was confirmed by Moose Chetlin, who was the chief NASA communications system back in '79. Uh, Ten years later, uh, NASA's communication guys admitted that was a code word. That's what it meant. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, Apollo 11, July 21st, 1969, both apparently saw lights in and on the crater, and they were, uh, and there were con unconfirmed reports that there were other spacecraft there, according to them. Two large objects watching them, they said. Armstrong is quoted in some reports as alluding to a CIA cover-up. That's what we're dealing with here. I could go through and give you more and more of these guys, but the net of it all, these should all be familiar words and names to you if you follow those, the, the, the news in those days. Let's talk about John Blaha. He was a veteran of five space shuttle missions. He's, resident, uh, he's the recent resident of the Russian Mir space station. We did that cooperative thing, space station out there. On March 24th in 1989, a radio ham listening on some frequencies that were not officially being used by NASA, picked up his voice. Uh, Houston, uh, this is Discovery. We still have the alien spacecraft uh, under repellent. They're using a non... They're using a private band that a, a radio ham happened to pick up and record. Well, if we go into this stuff, the documentation, there's 6,000 professional publications just in English, 2,200 foreigners, periodicals, and there's over 700 books that deal with the ancient history. There's over 300 books prior to 1650. There's an ancient, there's depth background here. And uh, many, there are many different polls. I just grabbed this one. 57 Americans, 57 Americans believe in UFOs. 15 believe they have seen a UFO. 1% claim an abduction experience. That's a disturbing number. That's a lot of people. The question is, are they real? They're seen on multiple radars simultaneously. They're seen by multiple reputable witnesses. They leave tangible evidences. Burnt ground, radioactivity, and sometimes other things. The paradox comes from this. They travel faster than the speed of sound without sonic booms. That can't happen. They make right angle turns at incredible speeds. They appear to be able to materialize and disappear at will. That's the most disturbing at all. Where are they when we don't see them? They defy known physical laws, is the point. So what's the conclusion of the researchers? Well, there's all kinds of researchers. See, the real evidence survives after screening of all the false data hoaxes and so forth. Physical evidence versus physical laws. The conclusion by the competent ones, in my view, indicate that they're interdimensional. They are not intergalactic. For a long time, even the professionals thought they came from another galaxy. No, they quickly proved to themselves that's not possible for a lot of reasons. They're not intergalactic. They're interdimensional. And that opens up a whole different perspective. Something else we now know is they exhibit an agenda of deceit. That's important to understand. And they, even the secular researchers, I'll, I'll, I'll mention the two most respected ones, believe they were demonic, and they use that term even without theological training, demonic in origin. I happen to have an exposure to a thing, a classified project called Project Delta. It was a classified study of 473 documented cases. A 1994 report on multiple objects seen by multiple witnesses concluded that UFOs are aerospace vehicles of non-terrestrial origin being operated under highly intelligent flight control. These 473 incidences were demonstrations of formation flying. And that was the purpose of the study, and that was the conclusion of the study. And I can't go into more than that. But the two most respected researchers in this area, unquestionably, are J. Allen Hynek, he's the one on the left, and Jacques Vallée on the right. And these are earlier pictures, but it shows them together. And, uh, they're, and uh, Jacques Vallée is uh, born in 39. He's a venture capitalist, computer scientist, author, astronomer, currently residing in San Francisco, California. 
In mainstream science, he's notable for co-developing the first computerized mapping of Mars for NASA and for his work at SRI International, uh, creating the ARPANET, which was the predecessor to the Internet. He was also an important figure in the study of UFOs, first noted for the defense of scientific legitimacy of extraterrestrial hypothesis, and later for promoting the interdimensional hypothesis. And he's the author of both of those, actually. Now, J. Allen Hynek's another guy. He passed away in 86. He was a United States astronomer, professor, and ufologist. He acted as the scientific advisor to the UFO studies undertaken by the U.S. Air Force under three consecutive names, Project Sign, 47 to 49, Project Grudge in 49 to 52, and Project Blue Book from 52 through 69. If you happen to have seen the movie, Close Encounter of the Third Kind, at the end of the movie, there's where the aliens come, there's a crowd and all that. And if you look closely, J. Allen Hynek shows up as an extra. I was on the board with Alan Adler in those days, and he, he mentioned that to us, that, that they, they let him you know, have a, a token role in the movie. And so if you look at that, you'll find him in there, incidentally. That's just a movie. Don't misunderstand me. That was just a movie. They made. But um, for decades afterwards, Hynek conducted his own independent UFO research developing the close encounter classification system and is widely considered the father of the concept of scientific analysis of both reports and especially trace evidence purportedly left by UFOs. And uh, he initially was very skeptical but later convinced himself from residual evidences and so forth. He was the founder and the head of the Center for UFO Studies, an organization stressing scientific analysis of UFO cases and their extensive archives include valuable files from civilian research groups such as NICAP, one of the most popular and credible UFO research groups of the 50s and 60s. So he established himself as a, a credible. But I want to shift gears and introduce you to something else, and that's Majestic 12. There are two kinds of people in the world, those that have never heard of Majestic 12, and those that know it's just a big hoax. Let me explain a little why how that all came about. It's going to explain, I'm trying to explain to you the role of disinformation. Misinformation we know about. Disinformation is deliberate misinformation. Top secret magic eyes only. In 1984, uh, several documents surfaced within the UFO community. A briefing addressed to President-elect Dwight D. Eisenhower by Rear Admiral Roscoe Hillencoder dated 18 November 52, and also a special classified executive order, number 092447, signed by President Harry S. Truman, Secretary of Defense James, two, uh, Secretary of Defense James Forrestal, dated 24 September 47, and authorized him to establish a board of suitably qualified persons to be answerable directly and only to the President, and to be known as Majestic 12. That was the initial code name. Majestic, that's with a J. Majestic 12. Okay. And these documents floated and created quite a stir at the time. Okay. The, the, the attachment, the, the special classified executive order 09447 was signed by President Arias Truman, authorizing him to establish a board of suitably qualified persons. There were 12, six civilians, six military, to be known as Majestic 12. Their job was to investigate a crashed UFO that had been recovered near Roswell, New Mexico, in July of 1947. Tracking this so far? Okay. Now, the 12 people are rather, it, it were very, very famous people at the time. James Forrester, Secretary of Defense. Uh, Helen, Helen Carter was a key guy. Vannevar Bush was a legend in his own right. General, General Nathan F. Twining, head of the Air Force. General Hoyt Vandenberg. General Robert Montague, and then a group of others you might not have heard of, but they're civilians of various kinds. And uh, so none of these were elected officials. All were extremely important people. Three were original members of the first three directors of the Central Intelligence, which was the post-war successor to the, Office of, uh, the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, uh, which was the forerunner to the CIA. One of these was Secretary of Defense. Five others were top scientists in aviation research and development. They all had the highest clearances available. Okay. After the death of Secretary Forrestal, uh, General Walter Smith replaced him in, in 49. So much for that. Now, Admiral Hillencotter 
had not been just a Navy man. He was the first director of the CIA, which was also established in September of 47, by the way. Roswell was July of 47, so get a feeling for this. He retired from the U.S. Navy in June of 57, and soon afterward joined the Board of Governors of NICAP, considered the most influential UFO organization. Vannevar Bush, world-renowned scientist, as head of the Office of Scientific Research and Development, he led the development of the atomic bomb, the proximity fuse, radar, and a hundred other high-tech systems and military applications. His name is a legend in, that, in the, that era. And the list of achievements goes on and on and on. But it's also interesting to know that uh, Vannevar Bush was the guy that was well known for the compartmentalization of classified work. I'll come back to that later. And um, contrary to the normally wide-ranging access permitted in most research settings, he insisted that working scientists be permitted access only to the classified information they need to do their jobs. So we'll come back to that interesting idea. Well, th this is circulating, and then skepticism starts to rise because the MJ-12 papers are starting to get a big beating. The typewriter that was used to type the Truman executive order was deemed a Smith Corona model that had not been manufactured until 63. The signature on the memorandum had apparently been photocopied from an unrelated letter from Truman to Vannevar Bush back in October. Other anomalies were noted and published in various media. So it was a big, suddenly it was finally understood throughout the community that the MJ-12 was just a huge fraud, a hoax. There's many hoaxes, so this is no surprise, but this was a very elaborate one. Majestic 12. Except there's a guy in the background here, Stanton Friedman, interesting guy, a nuclear physicist, but he, one of these guys that likes to do library work. He spent over a decade painstakingly probing 20 libraries and archives to put, he put together dossiers on the 12 men that were presumably MJ-12. And he now has cast significant doubts about the doubters, if you will. Beyond refuting many of the documentation quibbles raised by the skeptics, he compiled dossiers on each of the distinguished 12, and he made some intriguing discoveries. By collecting the personal details on each of the ostensible members, some very significant corroboration emerged. Okay? General Nathan F. Twining had been scheduled to fly to Seattle on July 16, 47, to review the new B-50 bomber being built by Boeing and to do some fishing with old friends. Suddenly, General Twining canceled his Seattle trip and headed for New Mexico on July 7th. Really? Billed as a routine inspection, this doesn't jibe with the apparent urgency. It's also interesting that President Truman met with New Mexico Senator Chavez on July 9th with no reason given. These are things that come up from the research. But perhaps the most surprising discovery by Stan Friedman was the discovery that Donald Menzel led a doubled life. As a UFO debunker and a distinguished astronomer in public, he also is a linguist, cryptographer, and a consultant to the NSA and the DI, the, in other words, the National Security Agency, and also the, the NSA stands for not secret anymore, and uh, DI, the Defense Intelligence Agency, for more than 30 years holding top secret ultra clearance, all of which was not known to the general public. What's disturbing is that some of his debunking episodes, his technical explanations disputing UFO incidents were not scientifically defendable, which is not only surprising for this highly competent technologist, but is also strongly suggestive of a private agenda of disinformation. And that comes out pretty strongly if, uh, if you read Friedman's book. Now this gets to another discussion that's worth mentioning, and that's if you haven't any expo exposure to classification compartments. If you have a project, you obviously can classify the content of the, contra of the contract as top secret or whatever. That's the content. But if you're really nervous about it, you can declare the existence of the contract itself uh, classified. Those are called compartmented programs. They're wonderful because your competitors don't know they exist. And, uh, but I just, after 30 years as chairman and CEO of four different publicly traded defense contractors, I have to tell you, I encountered something for the first time after 30 years that surprised me. Uh, I discovered the, there is a level in which the existence of the customer is classified. 
There are legal systems and procedures to recover costs and disputes in a world in which the very existence of the players is classified. And I was startled to discover that. I was very much a player in it for some reasons I won't bore you with here. That's Q&A stuff probably, if you like. But the anatomy of secrecy, the role of compartmentalization, the content be classified, the existence of the contract classified, or the existence of the customer classified. And for this, for this reason and some others I don't want to get into, I personally strongly suspect, I'll say, that MJ-12 was real. It's since, of course, been superseded by a successor organization and labels, what have you. But there are occasional labels that are whispered only in certain hallways. And I believe that the whole business of disinformation is elegant here, where they let surface documents that become discredited, and everybody knows that MJ-12 was a hoax. What a beautiful way to hide it. That's the skill of what we call today disinformation. Well, let's get into the dark side. The truly dark side of the UFO phenomenon is the apparent quest for biomedical reproduction information by these creatures. And a number of books, such as Communion by Whitley Strieber and, uh, and Intruders by Bud Hopkins, made the New York Times bestseller list with grisly details of apparently alien abduction encounters that popularized this whole area. So let's not go down that path. There's a lot of nonsense there, too. But you may not realize there was a conference at MIT co-shared by uh, Dr. John Mack himself. Now, Dr. John Mack, author and co-author of over 150 peer-reviewed scientific papers that have appeared in academic journals and textbooks, he's a Pulitzer Prize winner. Due to his high profi the high-profile location of the conference, which was at MIT, it was attended by scientific investigators, abductees, and the media alike. And so uh, the, the, the credentials of John Mack, of course, eclipsed most of the others there. Uh, MIT physicist Pritchard was his co-chairman. But he also was a respecter of research in the field of atomic and molecular physics. Dr. John Mack was head of psychiatry for Harvard Hospital. And he personally dealt with 76 cases of abductees himself personally. And he concluded from that experience that something really happened to them. He didn't know what, of course. That the beings that they're involved with apparently are transdimensional, possibly outside our space-time domain. That this may be a prelude to a new paradigm of thought about spiritual, physical nature. But at the conference, he posed this question to the MIT conference. He says, if what these abductees are saying is happening to them, isn't happening, what is? They're all above average intelligence. They all had no prior psychiatric history. They all clearly had evidence of trauma. They had a, uh, a desire to hide rather than uh, reveal what, uh, what was going on. And his concern was, what's really going on? It's a, it, it, at, the, at the conference time, the reason it was so well attended, it's a major point of discussion among practitioners. Those things have increased, not decreased, by the way. They're just harder to talk about. And um, their, their reports are too bizarre to believe, yet they're too frequent and too consistent to ignore. Dr. John Mack gave several there at the conference. Travis Walton Affair was made into a movie. You can see the movie if you like. Um, James Garner plays a key part of it in it, Fire in the Sky. It was during that time, apparently, I get a call from a Hollywood producer. It's about that time that, that uh, Mark uh, Eastman and I put out the, the crazy book, Alien Encounters, and we were interviewed on the radio, and one of the remarks I made on the radio was that I believe that a Christian can't be abducted. And I get a call from this Hollywood producer he says, Chuck, I heard you're on the radio, and I, I happen to know a lot about this area, having participated in the project. I later found out what the project was. He said, but I, have to, I, had, to, I had to call you that because you need to check the um, affidavit of the Betty Andreessen affair. I was so startled by the phone call, I didn't pick up quickly enough to, to go into it. But the Betty Andreessen is a well-published document in this area. She was, for 20 years, a member of a spirit-filled community, Christian, but if you read her affidavit very carefully, she apparently was visited one night by some creatures that invited her and she accepted the invitation. That's technically what happened. And I argue, it may sound like I'm splitting hairs here, but I don't call that an abduction. 
an error on her part, but not what we call abduction. And we deal with that, by the way, in our book and so forth. I since have run into situations where someone has apparently been abducted and there's lesion and there's clearly evidence of medical intrusions. And my counsel to both the woman that was involved and her husband and the pastor that was involved is to take all that evidence, put it in the safety deposit box and don't tell anybody about it. Keep it a secret. Don't let anybody know. Because the journalists, if they find out, will destroy your life. And so uh, that's, the, that's the advice I gave them. I checked back a year later and they were doing fine and it, happens, it was involved with a pastor that I can trust. It's the only reason I allowed myself to get involved in the thing. But uh, no, these things are real. Well, let's talk a little bit about international politics. Is this thing heading for a global challenge of some kind? Are we possibly going to be united by a common enemy? Would a threat from the cosmos, such as an alien intruder, unite the disparate and desperate world into a common union committed to world peace? That's an interesting hypothesis, isn't it? Could a properly packaged one gather the entire world under his leadership? That's the other side of the same coin. Really. It may surprise you that President Ronald Reagan, on three occasions, suggested this. In his address on the, to the 42nd General Assembly of the United Nations on September 21st of 1987, President Ronald Reagan said, perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bond. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet I ask you, is not an alien force already amongst us? Now he made these kinds of remarks not only there, uh, December 4th in 85 in Maryland and on May 5th in 88 in Chicago. And, uh, and we, have some, we have some of that in the, in the book if you want to track those down. I'll give you one other example more recently. A citizen hearing on disclosure. Testimony to the U.S. Congress held on 29 April through the 3rd of May 2013 in Washington, D.C. These were non-governmental hearings chaired by six former U.S. congressmen aimed, according to the event's website, doing what the U.S. Congress had failed to do for 45 years. Paul Hellyer, he's the former Canadian Minister of Defense, testified as follows. At least four species of aliens have been visiting the Earth for thousands of years, in his view. There are live air extraterrestrials on Earth at this present time, and at least two of them are working with the United States government. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying he's correct or it's true necessarily. It's his testimony in this hearing. But he certainly is a non-trivial observer, and those are provocative statements. So let's talk a little bit about the ultimate UFO. In the next session, we're going to explore the most astonishing UFO tale of them all. It involves what most of us would regard as the most conservative group on the planet. The Vatican, of all people, is now actively and openly preparing to receive an alien visitor. You've got to be kidding. What's that all about? A book was published here a year ago by Tom Horn and Chris Putnam about the Pope prophecies. That's an area that it was published in 10, uh, 2012 in which they explore these. What was interesting, these beliefs that go behind the Pope prophecies is that the coming Pope would be the last Pope, strangely enough. A lot of people take that seriously. In this book, they predicted that the then standing Pope would abdicate, something that hadn't happened for 600 years. But they predicted that in, in a thing published April of 2012. Okay? In, 2013, in February of 2013, when the Pope did abdicate, they were on the front headlines. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Did quite a job. It doesn't stop there. They came out with a subsequent book 
And I, have to, I, I, I still haven't had Tom explain to my satisfaction how he puts titles on his books. But he calls it Exo Vaticana. And it is the most scholarly treatment that I've ever run into about UFOs and astrobiology and all of that. I, I'm well read in that area. I, I, uh, we published our own book. In fact, it's because of our pivotal work years ago with alien encounters that they asked me, both uh, Tom Horn and Chris Putnam, to do the introduction to this book that was coming out. So they gave me advanced copies of the chapters so I could do the introduction. And as I, got, as I acquainted myself with this, the level of scholarship that they pulled together, I was stunned. It was an incredible piece of work about, about topics that you can't find out that stuff anywhere else. It's just, it's just amazing. So these authors strike again. And this was published in April of 2013 and explores the current preparation of the Vatican to receive an anticipated alien visitor. Now, it may come as a shock to discover that the vaunted resources of the Vatican itself is preparing for the strangest commitment imaginable. Why? Why are they doing this? Openly. So in our next session, we're going to explore the current preparations of the Vatican, and we'll also explore some other related mysteries on our near horizon. That will be session two. And with that, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Well, Father, we thank you for this evening, and we thank you for your word. We pray, Father, that you would help us through your spirit to measure all these things against your word of truth. For that's the truth that we embrace, that's the truth that we rely on, and that's the truth that holds our future. We thank you, Father, for your, tr your, your truth, your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit and his attention to, uh, to every detail. We pray, Father, that you would open our hearts and lives to, the, to this word, that you would help us to discover what it is that you would have of us as we prepare for the coming turmoil that is clearly on the horizon. We thank you, Father, for who you are above all things. We thank you for being with us as we commit ourselves into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our coming King, indeed. Amen. Amen.